Now the topic today is what will 5G mean to you? Most of you who are listening to this presentation are listening because you want to decide whether you should purchase a 5G phone. At the end of this talk, I will certainly answer that question, but 5G will be changing our lives in different ways. What about the crane operator who no longer has to climb tall buildings to operate the equipment? Or the surgeon who can remotely operate on a patient many miles away? Or the Uber car that shows up to take you for groceries and has no driver? The city planner who is designing mass transit for the future? Or the school systems, the school systems implementing distance education? With 5G comes speed, but it is the low latency that allows us to do these time-sensitive tasks. What will it mean to you living in a community? With 5G, there will be many more towers being built. Will you accept a tower being built next to your house? Uh, will you uh, accept a tower being built next to your house? Are radio waves safe? You will be canvassed by people who say no and don't want this technology built next to their community. These people are called tin hats. And this is a big obstacle to 5G as California residents are finding out. In the information meetings your communities are putting on, these issues will be coming up. What will it mean to all the employees of cable companies who will see their jobs lost? The transition is occurring quickly and two bankruptcies announced this week are just the start of many more to come. As we transition from wired to wireless, there will be a huge retraining task as people migrate to different companies. Cable companies are a thing of the past and will be gone sooner than you think. What this means to the cord cutters who desperately seek freedom from cable companies, has the solution finally come with 5G? My presentation title today, What Will 5G Mean to You?, should answer many of these questions. Now, before we talk about 5G, I just wanted to let you know that um, China Ministry of Science and Technology recently launched the preparatory work for the development of a future network. The foundations are already laid, and in the opinion of some experts, 6G speeds could reach one terabyte per second. China has a very well-developed 5G uh, uh, system that is uh, powered by Huawei, as does Southeast Asia. Um, but let's talk about our 5G that we'll be installing across Canada and United States. But I want to look at the history of, um, of, of wireless technology. And we start with the big breakup of Ma Bell in the early 1980s. This was a big, uh, big, big, uh, um, big breakup of a, of a very large company. Now, uh, as part of the, uh, of the breakup, they gave a, um, a little company out west that was uh, in the Seattle area called Verizon, about 100,000 customers. So this was the start of building a very large company, which is a national company now that, has, uh, that spans across the United States. So um, if we look at the technology, uh, in 1980, we had 1G, then there was 2G, then there was 3G, where there was 4G and 5G. But what does G stand for? G stands for generation. And if you look at each of those generations, there's nothing that the, the next generation used from the previous one. It's all new technology. So in 1980, we had um, the first generation of technology that was uh, in... Um, that was used for for cell phones. This uh, this was an this was a uh, analog basis and not digital. And if you look over to the right, you'll see uh, Don Johnson in Miami Vice and his very famous first uh, cellular phone that you'll see using in his car. This was uh, this was on the one G um, uh, networks. Now, when Verizon um, got their uh, go ahead with the breakup of Ma Bell. They decided to, uh, if you were in the boardroom, I'm sure they sat there and decided to become a national company. And they had to choose what type of networking standard they would choose. And they chose a networking standard called CDMA. 
Now, I know that many people in the audience today are over the age of 40. If you are under the age of 40, you will not understand what I'm about to say. But there used to be a technology called VHS and Betamax. And this is exactly the same analogy. When, I, um, <clears throat> when the technology uh, for taping came along, I did my research and bought the best technology, which was Betamax. Following beta came along VHS. Soon VHS became the standard and Betamax was discontinued. You all know that story. The same story with CD, CDMA and GSM is, is true. Um, Verizon started the standard. They chose a standard called CDMA to initiate their networks. This was the first digital standard and was what we called 2G. The rest of the country uh, and all the other cell phone companies around the world went with GSM. So now we had uh, one network called CDMA and the other network called GSM. What did this mean? Well, you can remember all those day, all those years where you had uh, a cell phone from Verizon and it wouldn't work on AT&T. And we went through this for the 2G and in fact the 3G when uh, all these companies built up large client bases and became national companies because you couldn't, you couldn't swap phones. You couldn't move your phone from one, from the CDMA to the GSM because it didn't have the radio transmitters in there. So we had, uh, the companies made a lot of money. They liked this because uh, once you bought a Verizon phone, you had to stay in the Verizon network. And um, the other, um, and the same thing, if you bought an AT&T phone, you couldn't use it on the Verizon network because they were two, two different competing networks. So we moved from 2G to 3G, and we saw more uh, data being used, and the first mobile broadband came on with, with, with the advent of, of 3G. But we still had the two competing networks uh, across, the, uh, across the United States and Canada, which uh, didn't allow for the, uh, tr the movement of phones from one network system to the other. Then what happened in um, about 10 or 15 years ago, Apple brought out the first iPhone. And this was the first smartphone that came along. And with the smartphone technology, we needed faster data. And this prompted the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, networking uh, to re-network all the towers to what we call 4G. And today, 4G is really LTE, and it is a common standard. The uh, last uh, CDMA towers went away from Verizon about two years ago, so it, we are living in a bit of a utopia now because all phones work on all networks because the, the, all the towers in the United States are LTE. Now, uh, we're going to talk today about 5G, and this is a new standard and what's happening with 5G. So this is the 5G road. Uh, you'll see that there's Internet of Things. You'll see that there's driverless cars. You'll see the, uh, the uh, construction workers we talked about. You'll see the hospitals that are going to change. You'll see the transport that's going to change. You'll see video conferencing and wearable technology. All these are gonna change our lives in a big way. And this is just the evolution of the G's that you can see. Now, how fast is 5G? Everybody asks me this question. If, you, um, if you've seen the movie Guardians of the Galaxy and you want to download it, if you tried to download that uh, movie, and you tried to do it on a 3G connection, it would take 26 hours. If you downloaded the, the movie on a 4G connection, it would take six minutes. And if you downloaded the, um, it on a 5G connection, it would take 3.6 seconds. So these are the time differences that is going to uh, occur. But with speed, it brings low latency. In other words, when you initiate a command, you need the command to occur very quickly. And as you'll see with these autonomous driving cars in this picture, that if, uh, if a car required braking, it needs to be done 
very quickly because these cars in very close proximity. So we're not just talking about speed, but we're talking about low latency. This also makes it possible for the surgeon to do remote brain surgery. So when he, the scalpel goes down by the robot who is being controlled by a remote surgeon, it has to be very accurate. And that low latency is, is what will make these networks work. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, speed. And when we talk about the internet, I think everybody understands that there's an upload and a download speed. Now, um, if you um, request a web page, then that's an upload. You're sending, uh, you're sending information to a website, and that's an upload. The web page then downloads to your, uh, your computer, and that is a download speed. Most of the, what we talk about today is download speeds. Now, if you look um, over to the left here, you'll see that cable systems, the average is about 100 megabits per second as a download speed. Now, I know that some are less, and I certainly know some of you have three or four or 500 megabit downloads on cable. In fact, you can on cable actually get up to just under a gigabyte. But the average person, I think, uh, today is probably on cable is around 100 megabits per second. If you look at the wireless LTE that we talked about, the 4G LTE, the theoretical capable download speed of a wireless system is 1500 megabytes or 1.5 gigabytes. On a 5G, the standards for 5G, the download speed would be 5000 megabits per second. So you'll see that the 5G system is 50 times faster than the cable. And I want you to try and remember those figures because we're gonna come back to those in a few minutes. Now, this is a, uh, this is a picture of the uh, Verizon LTE tower outside my house. I can actually look out my window and see this tower. Now, in 2000, this is a 4G LTE tower, and I want you to, pick, want you to watch this carefully. In 2017, my hotspot recorded on that tower 30 megabit per second download, and if it was network congested, it would go down to about 5 megabits per second. In 2019, the same tower, the download connection gave me around 180 bits per second, and the network congestion was around 130. So this is the same tower, the same LTE, but just an improvement in the software and the capacity of that tower. Now in 2020, the cap capacity of this LTE tower um, is going to be, it could be up to 1,000 megabits per second. Remember I told you the LTE will download up to 1,500 megabits per second. So one of the things that's going to be happening with these LTE towers is that they're going to be used for 5G. And the 5G will be uh, roughly 1,000 megabit per second download as compared to the 4G on the same tower at 130 and, and, and as you'll see that what we just talked about. Now, why is this important? This is important for the following reasons is that you have about one million towers in the United States. And uh, it's going to cost about $1 million per cell tower to put in the high speed um, 5G connections. So for all those wizards uh, that are in the audience and can do financial math, a million times a million is a trillion. And that's, uh, that's a lot of money and that's how much it's gonna cost to convert just the cell towers in the United States to the fast 5G. So how are we gonna go about this? Well, in fact, they're going to be calling 5G, they're gonna be running it over the 4G LTE towers. And so you're gonna actually have two standards. You're gonna have the, the 4G LTE, which your phones have now, 
you're going to have the slow 5G LTE, which will be running at about 1,000 megabits per second. And then some of the towers will have the brand new technology called millimeter wave, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And this will be the fast 5G, and that will be up to 5,000 megabits per second as your download. So you're going to have three different types of towers. We're going to come back to this slide. This is an extremely important slide when you're considering purchasing a 5G phone because you need a software on there called dynamic spectrum sharing. And this allows you to switch between the slow 5G and the fast 5G networks. We're going to come back to this slide, but I just wanted everybody to understand what we're dealing with here. So what is a 5G network? And I'm going to argue that, um, well, uh, we're going to talk about the millimeter wave standard in a few minutes that Verizon has adopted. But clearly, there are many other forms and even forms to be discovered, invented, used uh, in the future that will make up our 5G network. The 5G standard is that it must be low latency. It must have a high bandwidth. It has a higher capacity for number of devices. And it specifically has a minimum download speed of 5 gigabits per second and an upper of around 20 with a one millisecond latency. Those are the 5G standards. So let's talk about the 5G phone. Now this is where I like to uh, show off with uh, a lot of new fancy slides and new terminology. But I'm going to make this really simple for everybody because I've got lots of pictures. We're going to talk about the millimeter waves. We're going to talk about small cell massive MIMO, beamforming, and full duplex. Now, don't worry, it's real simple. So what is the millimeter wave? The millimeter wave is a very high frequency wave. If you look at the bottom here, you'll see that the, um, that the, 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 the radio wave spectrum, it is, this is the 4G spectrum here. But if we go up into the high frequency, these are very, very, um, uh, uh, Quick rate, these are very fast uh, radio waves with very short wavelengths, and we can make these uh, very quickly. These, these are very fast. And this is in this uh, spectrum here of uh, between 24 gigahertz and 100 gigahertz. And we, we've never used this, this spectrum before, so it's available, and there's lots of bandwidth in this area. The reason we haven't used this before is because millimeter waves have worse range and worse penetration compared to LTE. The signal can be blocked by buildings, trees, and even your hand. And the millimeter wave doesn't even work in the rain and it doesn't work in fog. The higher frequency means millimeter wave has plenty of bandwidth and low la latency if you can get it. So why in the heck would you ever want to use something that doesn't work in the rain, the fog, it doesn't go through trees, it doesn't go through buildings? Why would we want to be using this technology to, uh, to use for our cell phones? Well, the reason is we can make lots of these high frequency uh, signals. Uh, we have a, a lot of opportunity to really sort of flood the, flood the airwaves with this. So we can make lots of them. They're very fast, but they don't go very far. And that is called the millimeter wave. And again, so you'll see um, the 3G, 4G, which we have now, has, has, a, has a much slower, the waveform is much longer compared to these really fast, short uh, 5G signals. Now, in a perfect world, your 5G phone will always be connected to a millimeter wave spectrum. But this ideal world would need a ton of millimeter wave towers to compensate for the millimeter wave shoddy coverage. So your phones will need to switch between 4G and 5G, and they do that. The current, uh, the current phones today will switch between those. So what is a small cell? Well, this would be uh, what your neighborhoods, I alluded to this in my opening remarks, this is what your neighborhoods are going to be changing to. And if you look at uh, the bottom picture here, you'll see the small cell stand uh, with on a, uh, on a, on a light, uh, light pole. You'll see here it is on a power pole. And these will be going up in your neighborhood 
and they will be providing uh, signals that are coming out through your community. The problem is, is that if you stood on one side of your house and you had the, uh, the tower and you could see the tower, you could get the signal, but if you went to the other side of your house, you wouldn't because the, these, these millimeter waves won't go through your house. So you'll need plenty of these, these towers, these, these on lamp posts to be able to give a full 360 degree coverage. And this is called small cell. And this is how, how your community would look in this diagram here. You'll need lots of these towers around, not towers, I guess they're add-ons to light posts and, and power poles. Now, in the downtown sections, in sections where you need lots of uh, capacity, we're going to be talking about massive MIMO. This is multiple in, multiple out. These are uh, large, um, these are very large, and these, um, they're multiple systems that will be able to uh, transmit because it's going to be in the downtown center. Now, um, in, in Mesa, Arizona, um, just uh, north of me by about half a block is um, um, Highway 60. And if you drive down Highway 60 on the north side, you'll see the, um, the exit ramp. On every exit ramp, you will see a 5G tower such as this. This is a picture of one of the towers just off. Actually, I can see it from my house. And this is a 5G tower uh, ready to go down this major transportation corridor. So the massive MIMO is going to lead to a whole bunch of signals being broadcast. And if you can imagine in this picture here, you'll see this is a very confusing picture. You've got multiple MIMOs. You've got all these radio, these millimeter waves going all around, and it's going to be collisions with those waves. So we will need something called adaptive beam switching. This is at like a control tower at an airport. This is so, uh, so yet there will be another aerial, and this is, uh, these are uh, an example of, of the, uh, the beam steering antenna, and this will control these, all these radio waves. It's going to be like the, um, the uh, uh, control tower of an airport, and it's going to um, uh, tell them where to go and control them, and that's called beam forming. Now the next um, the next thing is very interesting. <clears throat> if you, um, I want you to everyone to think back at walkie talkies, and um, if you have had, you've probably used walkie talkies in the past. These uh, these broadcast back and forth between two people on one channel, and when they, you are talking in a walkie talkie, you have to say over, and then the other person can talk, and then the 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 the, uh, the information goes back. If you both push, push the broadcast button, it goes beep, right? And because it is not possible to transmit two at the same time over one, uh, one channel. So how do cell phones work? This is very interesting. Have you ever thought about that? It's not possible to transmit on, one, to, on a cell phone. You can, you can listen and hear just like a regular uh, analog phone. You can hear and, and transmit well, someone's both ways. So how does that work? Well, the way cell phones work is actually you're transmitting on one frequency and receiving on another. You're actually using two frequencies on every call. You're transmitting on one and receiving on another. Now, uh, and that's, this, is, uh, this is exactly how it works. We have two trains, one on one track and one on the other. Now, what we're able to do with um, with 5G is we're able to do full duplex. In other words, we can now send information down and back on one frequency. The, the software has been um, made that can actually do that. We can now transmit and receive on one frequency, which is full duplex, which also allows for uh, better transmission and faster speed. So in summary, we have our millimeter wave, which is this small, rapid little thing that's going to be zapping around. Um, and then the first broadcast will be small cells, which you'll see in your communities. In the larger areas, you'll see the massive MIMO um, towers. And then there will be another beamforming tower, which is the controlling one, and it'll be running on full duplex. 
So um, the next question I wanted to address is how worried should you be about the health risks of 5G? Now, uh, why would I bring that up? And this is, a, this is an important uh, topic because as California is finding out with, the, uh, um, with a lot of these towers going up in communities, uh, residents are upset, they're worried, and people have told them that these, um, these uh, radio waves cause cancer. So let's look at this. Is 5G safe? And this will be an issue that will come up in your community and you should understand this. Now, first of all, if you look at the top of this uh, building, you'll see the, um, the 5G tower broadcasting down uh, onto, these, uh, onto this road. But remember what I've told you about 5G in the millimeter wave is that uh, it doesn't go in buildings, it doesn't go through clothes, if it rains, it won't work, and if the wind blows, it'll blow it away. So, if, so for the residents inside this building, we'll have little of the 5G will have little effect on them. Now, <clears throat> what, I, um, what I wanted to uh, bring up is uh, to talk a little bit about ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Now, um, as you probably are aware, the ionizing radiation is the, is the bad radiation that is going to cause problems for you. Ionizing radiation actually changes the cellular structure in a cell when it comes in contact with ionizing radiation and, and the cell dies. Now, you know that because um, <clears throat> you all know that if you get gamma rays from a nuclear blast, you're going to get leukemia. You, uh, you will know that if you have cancer, we often use um, x-ray or radiation to kill the cells that are causing cancer. So this is a common thing that we use in the medical field. And of course, you all know if you lay out in the sun too long, you're going to get skin cancer, and that's, of course, the ultraviolet. But as we move down the spectrum here, we'll see visible light, infrared, and we see microwaves, and then we see radio waves, like radios in your car. So the 5G spectrum is sitting down between microwaves and radio waves in your car. It is way down on the uh, electromagnetic spectrum and is non-ionizing radiation. So it is perfectly safe. Well, maybe. So in 19, uh, 2011, the World Health Organization looked at this and, um, and had a big international symposium. And it was classified as a, uh, it was classified under the World Health Organization as a 2B uh, classification. The 2B, um, the 2B classification said this agent is possibly carcinogenic to humans. And this is what the tin hat people and the people against uh, 5G technology will be bringing up and, and talking about. Dr. Jonathan Samet with, with the University of Southern California was the chairman of the group that indicated the 2B classification. They found absolutely no evidence in all the research they did that there was, then there's been plenty of studies that there was ever any link between cell phones, radio waves, and cancer. They were concerned though that in the future as technologies changed, that we should have ongoing uh, surveillance of this. Therefore, they put it in the 2B classification. I've listened to uh, Dr. Samet on the radio. I've listened to the interviews. This caused a whole bunch of controversy, uh, but I can tell you that um, there has been no increase in brain cancer uh, in the last um, 20 years. In fact, there's even a little bit less. Now, I say this telling you that my very best friend uh, died two years ago of an astrocytoma of the brain. He had brain cancer. My wife's very best friend just died of an astrocytoma of brain cancer. And my good friend of mine at our local airport, who was the CEO of the airport, has a terminal astrocytoma brain cancer. If you asked me now, I would say there's a, um, there is an epidemic of brain cancer. But I'm a scientist, a researcher, and a physician, and I can tell you that when you look at the data, that simply isn't true. There's no evidence 
their radio waves and cell phones. There's no in, in, increase in, in brain cancer. In fact, there's a little bit of a drop off. Now, the CDC says it's perfectly safe. The FCC says it's safe. The FDA says it's safe. And the National Cancer Institute says there is currently no consistent evidence that non-ionizing radiation increases the risk in humans. So I think until otherwise, this technology is perfectly safe. Now, uh, we've talked about, uh, of course, we can talk about the Internet of Things. This will all make uh, these uh, devices uh, faster as 5G comes along. And we talked about, again, the, uh, the, the technology which will be used for highways, street lights, and vehicles. This will make, because of the low latency. So what will it mean to me? It'll mean uh, changes in the way that you drive, the changes the way you, with you interact with the health system. You're going to find uh, also uh, dramatic changes in television. Uh, as you know, the um, um, we are pretty well the standard now for 4K, and uh, 8K is certainly coming down the road. But the technology, once we switch to 5G networks, all the televisions will be, there will be new to it technology developed and that will all change. So, will I need a new phone to use 5G? Of course. Absolutely, you're going to need a 5G phone. 5G phones are going to be more expensive than 4G. Of course. Who would think it would be less? Uh, everything is going to cost more. So 5G phones will cost you more money. Now, um, what about the consistency? Is, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen with this? It's all fine and dandy to get extremely fast speeds on 5G, but I've already told you that it's very unreliable. The millimeter wave doesn't work very well. So uh, in order to make cell phones consistent, uh, of course, it will have to be backward compatible to 4G. Now, um, also, I wanted to just look at the, uh, the chips. Smartphones today are almost entirely powered by a single chip called a SoCal or System on a Chip. And Qualcomm is the only company with a single chip modem solution that sees significant distribution around the world. The single chip solution is a huge advantage resulting in a smaller, less complex, and cheaper motherboard on, these self, on our 4G phones. However, this isn't the case with 5G. We don't have that ability. So that means that there will be extra chips in the phone. So you'll see in the 5G, we now need two chips. And also, you're going to need four antennas in each cell phone. You'll need antennas around the whole outside of the cell phone as you see, uh, it, well, I'll show you that in the next one diagram. And you'll see, of course, the, the size of these devices. And here's an example of a cell phone, and you'll see that the antennas, uh, they're putting all the antennas all around the outside to try and pick up these millimeter wave signals. So um, again, this adds to complexity of the phone and adds to the weight and the size of these phones. Now, the weather could get in your way. Of course, summer heat cripples 5G, so that's a problem. And also, you're going to need more battery capacity because 5G will use up more battery. So batteries will be an issue. You're going to need a bigger phone, a thicker phone, and it's going, you're going to need to uh, be, be patient with the battery. And most of us now have come to realize that our batteries uh, work just fine through the day and we only need to charge it once a day. So 5G phones may need multiple charging through the day. So for sure, 5G phones are going to be more expensive. Uh, there's going to be more hardware. They're going to be bigger. They're going to need more power. There's going to be reception problems with millimeter waves. Uh, they're going to need to be backward compatible with 4G. And they're going to have to have future compatibility with different 5Gs. Remember the CDMA GSM? Remember that disaster when we couldn't use our phones on all the carriers? Man, are we going down that road again? And of course, there's going to be the increased cost. What is uh, important is that, um, remember when I talked about slow 5G and fast 5G? 
the ability to switch between the slow 5G and fast 5G is called dynamic spectrum sharing. And this actually is not available on any phones yet. It won't be available till later on this year. So another problem with buying early technology is that uh, you're gonna, if you are thinking of buying a smart or a 5G phone right now, um, it will not have dynamic spectrum sharing. So I would strongly advise that you wait a while uh, before purchasing this technology as this changes rapidly. Now, when we talk about 5G, we're talking about two things. We're talking about mobile 5G and fixed base 5G. Now, what I'm gonna say about mobile 5G, which we just discussed, is that's the, your phones. I'm gonna say hold and wait on that technology. But there's a technology now that everybody should be aware of called fixed base 5G, and this you should move on to. So where are we gonna get the, uh, the one trillion dollars uh, to fund the system that's gonna be building these networks? And as we carve up the country and all the cable countries, companies leave, what you're gonna be seeing and what you are seeing right now is uh, the uh, wireless companies are offering you uh, incredible deals on fixed base 5G. And this is where you will have the 5G tower next in, in your neighborhood, and there will be an antenna on the top of your house, and the tower will send the 5G signal down to the antenna, and then, uh, then it will come into your house through a modem. And this will allow the very fast 5G to be broadcast to your house. And, and why is this important? Well, um, this is available now, and it's available in most major cities, and where 5G has been, fixed base 5G has been introduced, there's usually lineups down the block as people are waiting to convert. And the reason is, is because of the cost. You'll find all the companies that are doing this uh, they're initiating, they want, as we carve up the land, they really want to sign up you as a customer early on because this is a huge amount of money. And all the companies are offering about $50 a month for, uh, for um, 5G service coming to your house. And this would include, in a lot of cases, uh, unlimited data. It includes television, your complete television spectrum, uh, including um, PBS and sports, and it also includes a home phone. This is all bundled and oftentimes includes Apple TV, Google Chromecast. All this is bundled into about $50 a month. This is an incredible deal, and all of them are offering this as a contract. Oh, uh, here's my phone telling me I mentioned the magic word. Um, so all of these uh, companies are um, offering this at $50 to get you to sign up, and they'll usually do this for a two-year contract. This is an incredibly good deal, um, and I would really encourage you, if you have fixed base 5G coming to your area, which you will do, uh, then I would for sure sign up for this. Uh, again, um, I looked at this um, on Verizon yesterday, and I, I looked at it in, a, um, and I, there's a, a site you can go to on Verizon, and you put your address in, and it will tell you if 5G is available, and in my area, it's not yet. But when that tower does get 5G, I will be the first to sign up, because you'll get, um, uh, not only will you get 5G, you'll get Disney, and you'll get YouTube TV. All right, uh, that that's the end of the presentation. Uh, I think we've got about a few minutes for some questions, um, and um, yeah, I'm happy to answer answer any questions on the technology. Thanks for everyone for coming. Okay, okay. How fast do you think this is going to be rolling out? It's here. What the fixed base is here now? Um, it's just um, in. It's in all the major cities. Uh, across the United States. I mean, you just have to look at the Verizon website. But, you know, AT&T wants you as a customer. T-Mobile is doing the same thing. There's enormous competition because they all want to sign you up. This is, this is how fast all the cord cutters now are, are here we go. They're signing people up. In fact, 
The problem is they don't have enough installers to put the aerials up. It is a, a huge problem in trying to find manpower to put the hundreds of thousands of aerials up on roofs, who can climb ladders, who can install things. Uh, it, is, it is now, right now, uh, the fixed base 5G is the way to go, and it is available all across the United States. Okay. Um, if you get a fixed base 5G, can you use your 5G phone? No, no, that's a different, whole different question. And uh, you have to look at the fixed base 5G has nothing to do with a, a mobile phone. And I would hold off for another two or three years on the mobile 5G phone for, for a lot of reasons. And one of the biggest reasons is we don't fully understand how this is all going to play out over the next two or three years. And you don't want to be buying a phone that, you know, doesn't, for example, doesn't have the technology to switch between slow and fast 5G, right? Right. As I said, Des Moines does have some uh, 5G towers. Right. Well, there, you, as I said, they're going to be, it's sort of a bit of a fake 5G because remember, they're, in order to put the, millimeter wave stuff in a tower is a million dollars and they have to take all the guts out of the tower and put a whole bunch of new equipment in that tower mm -hmm. and, and to do a million towers in the United States it is going to take a lot of money and a lot of manpower so what you do is because the 4G the LTE can do about a thousand megabits per second download you can run sort of a slow 5G on an LTE tower so that's what they're doing. They're running, the, because the towers are already there, they can run these LTE towers and they can run what they call 5G. That's not really 5G, because 5G standards are supposed to be 5,000 megabit per second download, but at least it gets, it gets everybody up and running and they can say, we have a national 5G network. But in actual fact, if you look at the, they released two weeks ago, the actual areas that they've put the millimeter wave in and if you take Phoenix, for example, it's just in the downtown core. It's only like about five blocks in the downtown core that, that they have the millimeter wave towers set up and running. So, but yet they can run the 5G on the four LTE towers, which means it, you can get a much larger area and get people, act, get people up and running. Okay, somebody's saying that T-Mobile is touting Long range 5G now. Um, again, there, you, you know, it's 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 there. You just got to sign up for it. But I would be very careful. It'd be very very reticent about about purchasing a 5G phone for sure. Uh, not until uh, next year. Uh, I suppose you could make the argument if you lived in downtown Phoenix and you were in that core and and you worked down in that same area. Well, maybe maybe you could make the argument for buying a 5G phone, but it will offer little advantage to you. And the other thing is, you're going to see much better product with the with your existing LTE. Remember the slide I showed you three years ago: 30 megabyte download, same tower. Today, right outside my house, 180 megabit download, same phone, same hotspot, same everything. Um, so they are making the networks much better. So your LTE, your 4G will be working really very well for you. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much. As I said, we're probably going to have to get some people and see what's happening when they, when they, when it starts dropping next week. So I do thank you very much. And you've got his email there on the package. So if you have any questions, feel free to email him. And uh, someone asked if there's a 5 jot hotspot tethering available. And I know there is because of Verizon shop selling one here in town. Right. Yeah, there's, there's hotspots for 5G now. Yeah, but you got to have the 5G to get the hotspot. So you do. And, 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 it's about, and, it's, and it's not mobile. So you have to have it actually connected to a specific tower. It's not like you can take that, five, that hotspot and move it around. This was a mobile hotspot. Yeah, but I don't think you can take it and just sort of move it from tower to tower to tower. They might call okay. it mobile. They might call it mobile, but I don't think you can do that. 